you can turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the 56th chapter is where we're going to be. Hallelujah. Thankful for God's word. Amen. 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 Um, thankful for the old King James. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thankful for the old King James. That's the one. That's the one I started with. That's the one I'm going to end with. Amen. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I hear a little bit of an echo or something going on up here. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Maybe it's me. Hallelujah. That sounds a little better to me, but maybe it was me to begin with. Uh, Isaiah the fifty-six chapter. As you read the Old Testament, you will find that the cities in those days had walls around them for protection. Amen? So if you're against a border wall, <laughs> read the Old Testament and you won't be because they had walls around their cities and those walls were there to keep mm -hmm. the enemy out. Amen? Those that would want to do them harm. And you find that over and over, time and time again, one city that, that comes to mind that we, would, that we can relate to is uh, Jericho, the walls around it, and uh, how that God brought those down, and the city was shut up tight. They were trying to keep out God's people who were commanded to go in and take the land. But other cities throughout the Old Testament, you will find, had walls to protect them. And on, no, on top of those walls, there were watchmen. And it was the watchman's job... His duty to keep an eye out, to watch. And if there be some kind of danger, Brother Buddy, if there be some kind of <clears throat> harm, some enemy approaching, he was supposed to sound the alarm, to blow the trumpet, to let people know that there was danger coming, that he saw something suspicious, that there was danger in the area. And there's one part of Scripture, I don't have it up here, but they would call out, Watchman, what of the night? And he would tell them a report, whether all was well or whether they, there was some danger, whatever. And we find also in God's Word that he compares his preachers, his pastors, his shepherds, to those watchmen on the wall. A preacher is supposed to be one of his duties, one of his, and this we, as we see, Many pastors in this nation today, they are dialect, dialect in their duty. They, they are, they're not doing their duty. They're supposed to be a watchman, and that's that Jesus, uh, the Word of God compares uh, His preachers and His servants, His pastors, to those watchmen that are on the wall. Because His servants, His pastors, are supposed to warn people of sin and danger. But we don't see that happening in the land today and pretty much for the same reason that we find here in Isaiah the 56th chapter. We find Israel is in a mess. They are backslidden. They are turned to other gods. And the Lord in this chapter lays most of that blame at the feet of the men that were supposed to be the watchmen for God's people. They were supposed to let them know about evil, but they weren't doing that. And we find out why. Let's start in verse 10. It says his watchmen, talking about those that were supposed to be warning of evil, warning of danger, warning of the enemy, his watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are greedy, dumb dogs. Now I've been accused before of preaching a sermon or two that was pretty hard, but I don't think I ever preached one that had as hard of words as those there. He said, these watchmen, they are ignorant, they are blind, they are dumb dogs. It is says they, and then it says they cannot bark. How many people ever had a good watchdog? I never did. The dogs I always had barked at a shadow, a fly, whatever it was. They'd just be standing there barking, would nothing be happening. But if you get a good watchdog, he'll bark and let you know that somebody's coming or that there's danger or that somebody's prowling around or that there's somebody at the door. 
This here says these watchmen that were supposed to be proclaiming the warning of God, they were supposed to be telling the people and warning them of things, it says they couldn't bark. They were like a dumb dog. Then it says that they're sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber, unable to bark, unable to warn the people, refusing to warn the people. If you were a watchman in that day, and you were dialect in your duty, if you were asleep, if you were drunk, if you were not paying any attention, not only were you in danger, but the people of the city were in danger because you were not warning them, Brother Jim, of the dangers that, that, were, that were approaching. Mm -hmm. And we see today, we see pastors who take the pulpit and they... are not warning of the dangers. Right. They are not warning of the devices of the devil. They are not warning of the judgment to come. They are not warning of uh, uh, sending out the warning of God from the, from the walled to warn the people that danger is in the air, that danger is coming, that there are dangerous pitfalls, that there are devices of the devil that he would use. But instead of warning the people of that, they're asleep. The Bible attributes their, likens them to dumb dogs, greedy dogs. If we ever lived in a day where there were greedy preachers, we are living in that day today. Amen? Yes. If we ever lived in a day where preachers that take the pulpit on Sunday mornings around this nation, especially in mega churches, but little churches too, in mega churches, they warn of nothing because they are afraid that they will defend somebody. They're afraid that they'll wake them up. What kind of a person would I be if I went by Sister Patty's house and I saw it on fire, but I thought, well, it's midnight. I don't want to wake nobody up. Amen? I don't want to wake anybody up. I'm afraid they'll be upset if I wake them up. We need to be sounding the alarm from the top of the wall today that there are dangers that, that men and women of God who are supposed to be watchmen on the wall are not warning people about because they're afraid they will offend somebody. They're afraid that they will wake somebody up. People need to be woke up. People need to be woke up. Amen? It goes on in verse 11. It says, Yea, they are greedy dogs which can which cannot have enough. Amen? In other words, the more they get, the more they want. Oh, we see that today in the mega churches and the prosperity gospels. Greedy dogs, which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Meaning that they have no regard for the, for the condition of the people. They all look to their own way. Everyone to his gain... From his quarter. If that doesn't describe what we see going on in the Laodicean church age today, I don't know what does. We have preachers that are more concerned about keeping their position, more concerned about keeping their possessions than they are the souls of the people that are sitting in the pews. Amen? I would rather offend you and cause you to think about where your soul is going to spend eternity than to appease your conscience, pat you on the back, send you out every Sunday morning, let you think that you're okay, and you end up in hell blaming me for the reason that you were there. Amen? If the watchman fell asleep and the enemy attacked and he took the lives of the people, guess whose blood was guess where that, that blood was required at the hands of the watchman because he sent out no warning. There are multitudes of preachers today who stand behind pulpits with blood on their hands because they stand before thousands of people. They stand before millions on television, but they will not warn them of sin. They will not warn them of the dangers of, of sin and the fires of hell because they're afraid they will offend somebody. They are asleep on the wall. They are dumb, greedy dogs uh, who only look after their own welfare and can care less about what happens to you as long as you continue to put money into their coffers. That's pretty hard, ain't it? So is this chapter. So is what God's Word is. God's Word ain't always soft and easy. Amen? God is love, but God is also a God of judgment. <clears throat> and this here says that the watchmen that are on the wall... They have fallen asleep. They love their slumber. They don't want to be aroused out of their 
drowsy state. They want to continue to sleep. They are greedy dogs. They are dumb. They cannot talk. They do not bark. Well, they say a lot of things, but they just don't say nothing. Amen? They say a lot of things. They just don't say anything that will help the people. They cannot bark. They are greedy dogs. Prosperity seekers. Self-consumed. Oh, if we don't see that in the church today, I don't know. They are self-consumed. Always talking about the riches of this world and never talking about the riches and the glory of heaven. Hallelujah. Unwilling to warn, unwilling to say, unwilling to do anything that might ruffle the feathers of those that are in the pew because if they do, they might lose some people and they won't be able to go around at their big conventions and brag about how many thousands of people that they have. If I stood in the pulpit this morning in front of thousands of people, I don't have that concern this morning because we don't have thousands of people. But if, if I stand this morning in this pulpit in the front of five people, and I fail to preach to you the whole counsel of God and warn you of the dangers of sin and the fires of hell and the devices of the devil, then I am, I am, I should resign, give you my resignation and walk out the door because I am neglecting my duty as a watchman on the wall to sound the alarm, to sound the trumpet, to say, hey, there are dangers. There are dangers. Sin will still take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Compromising with the world still comes at a cost. Amen? It still comes at a cost. And it'll cost you more than you ever thought you would have wanted to pay in the end. Hallelujah. What he's saying here about these watchmen is pretty much the same, the same thing that Peter said in 2 Peter whenever he talked about those false teachers that would make merchandise of you. You can write this scripture down. We're not going to go there because we're not done in Isaiah. 2 Peter uh, 2 and 3. 2 Peter 2 and 3, he says, With feigned words, they will make merchandise of you. We are seeing that in the day that we live in today. Of course, it's always been like this. But I think with social media, with satellite, with cable, with, with all of these different things, we, you see it even more on a wide-scale basis. Amen? Many attribute the message of the cross to Jimmy Swaggart. Jimmy Swaggart didn't think up the message of the cross. The message of the cross has been in the Bible ever since God wrote by the Holy Spirit, by the hand of Paul and others. Mm -hmm. But because of the wide range of social media, because of the wide range of satellite, because of the wide range of television and, so, and all these different media, media outreaches, it caused the message to go out. For, there were people preaching the message of the cross before Jimmy Swaggart preached it, but they didn't have the platform that Jimmy Swaggart had to bring forth the message of the cross. And as I stand here in this pulpit this morning, I fear that even some of those that began preaching the message of the cross and testifying of how that's all they would ever preach, you're beginning to see other things begin to slip in that cause you to be on guard and that cause your spirit to be checked whenever they begin to talk about your victory is in your mouth. No, my victory is in the cross of Calvary. Amen. When they begin to talk about you speaking life. No, I can't speak life, but I know the one who can. Amen. I can't speak things into existence, but I know the one who can. Amen. When they begin to Attribute more power to the moving of the Holy Ghost than they do the power of the blood of Jesus. That's whenever we should begin to feel checked in our spirit. I know that's not that doesn't go over well with a lot of people, but it's the truth anyway. It's either the cross or it ain't. Amen. It is the cross and nothing plus, or it ain't. We have many today that will add to it. They will take away from it. They will preach other things. They will offer you other solutions. We see it in our Pentecostal denominations, psychology and the power of positive thinking and all of these things, these crutches that they want you to lean on that will only divert your attention from the cross of Calvary and the victory that He won there on our behalf. These men that stood on these walls that God is warning, he's, he's comparing these men to those that would stand on the wall and warn of the dangers. He lays some of the blame at the feet, most of the blame at the feet of his prophets and his preachers and his shepherds and his pastors for not preaching the truth to begin with. Amen. For not taking a stand because it wouldn't be popular. Because they were afraid of what man might do to them. And so the Holy Spirit calls them greedy, sleeping, 
dumb dogs who love their slumber. And like I said, I preached a lot of messages on prosperity preachers and the prosperity gospel and the lackadaisical church that we live in today, but I've never called them greedy dogs until now. That's because that's what the Word of God calls you. If all you're worried about is how much money somebody can put in your offering plate and you don't want to offend them because you're afraid they'll take their money somewhere else, you're one of the greedy, dumb dogs that he's talking about. If you're too afraid to get up this morning and preach something from your pulpit that you think will offend them and cause them to go somewhere else, you're one of the greedy, dumb dogs that he's talking about. Because it is not our job to win a popularity contest. Amen. Sadly, many Amen. preachers today have become more like movie stars and, and, and have fans and followers. Amen. Hallelujah. Then they do. They have groupies that will follow them from one place to another. God didn't call me to be popular. He called me to preach the truth. God didn't call me to be a movie star. He called me to preach the gospel. Amen. Glory to God. Give us some old-fashioned, unlearned preachers that just crawled out of the prayer closet in the presence of God who had their hair messed up and didn't have a tie on but they, and they looked a little rough for where but had been spending time in the presence of God give us some of those uh, instead of those that just sashay from the beauty shop from getting their hair done those that have to have their makeup done before they come out onto the platform give us some men and women of God that will stand behind the pulpit and proclaim the warnings uh, that are, we find in the book uh, hallelujah that the Holy Spirit has written for us to warn people that's a danger that's a danger. The devil has devices. He has weapons. And unless you know what those are, unless you know your source of victory, you're going to fall prey to them. But he compares these watchmen to dumb dogs. And Peter said, with feigned words, these false teachers will make merchandise of you. And it's not just the preachers. That's not where the only responsibility lies. Because the Bible says in the last days that there will be people that will heap to themselves. Teachers having itching ears. Amen. They'll go somewhere to hear what they want to hear. Amen. And if you do that, if you go somewhere, if your preacher preaches the truth and it bothers you so bad you go somewhere else so you'll be more comfortable, all of that blame, all of that blame can't be passed on to somebody else. Some of that blame belongs on you. And if your preacher gets up and he doesn't preach the truth, you have a Bible. If it don't line up with that book, go somewhere else. Amen. You're not going to be able to stand before God and say, well, my preacher preached this. Yeah, but what did the Bible say? Amen. My preacher said that. Yeah, but what did the Bible say? My preacher told me this. Yeah, but what did the Bible say? We need to make sure today that we're comparing what we hear to the Word of God. Amen. What does it say? Did I get through with verse 11? I don't know if I got through with verse 11 or not. Hallelujah. Uh, greedy. Looking after their own gain. Yeah, we got through with that verse. Verse 12. Verse 12. This is the message they had for the people. Come ye, say they. I will fetch wine. In other words, come get drunk on the same worldly pleasures that I'm drunk on. Men and women that will stand in the pulpit and say, I'm prospering. You need to be prospering like I'm prospering. I'm prospering because I'm speaking life over these situations. I'm prospering because I'm speaking, I'm speaking things into existence. You come and go with me. You better run as far from them nuts as you can get. Amen. He, the, the watchman says, hey, come get drunk like we are. Come and partake in the same thing that we are. I'll go fetch some wine. And we will fill ourselves with strong drink. And it says that tomorrow shall be as this day. And much more abundant. Oh, hallelujah. If you turn on your television this morning and watched about 80, 90%, if you, st if you checked in on what they were preaching, you'd find out it wasn't a hard message. It was one about that you're okay, I'm okay. God wants everybody to prosper. God loves everybody. And everything we touch or to be coming up roses or everything we touch, we should have the Midas touch. Everything that we touch or to be coming up gold. Amen. They were drunk. Hallelujah. They were drunk on the world and they were compelling. They were asking. They were beckoning others to get drunk on the world with them. They will cause you to get your eyes off of your heavenly treasure and get your eyes on the earthly treasures below. Amen. And what are we talking about this morning? Ain't been no easy road to plow this morning. Amen. I can tell you that right now. But that's okay. We've plowed hard roads before. Amen. Hallelujah. 
We're talking about greedy, dumb dogs that will lead you astray for their own personal gain. We are talking about watchmen, Brother Jim, that are asleep on the wall, that are drunk on the cares of this life and are not warning God's people of the dangers. Whenever things begin to come in to divert their attention away from the cross onto other things, they're not warning them, hey, don't do that. Keep your eyes on the cross. Amen. Don't put your faith in your own self. Keep your eyes on the cross. Don't put your faith in your own works. Keep your eyes on the cross. Don't put your faith in your religion. Keep your eyes on the cross. Don't put your faith in signs, miracles, and wonders. Keep your faith in the cross. We're not hearing those things because they want everybody to feel comfortable. I heard a preacher say of a mega church, might as well call his name. Somebody will say, how dare you call his name? Well, how dare him pervert the gospel for his own personal gain? Amen? Joel Osteen said that there are homosexuals, there are Muslims that come to his church and they worship long side by side of everybody else. And he don't want to leave. he don't want them to leave feeling bad. He wants them to feel living good. He wants them to leave feeling good. He don't want to put he don't want them to feel cast down or that they've been beat on or that they've been picked on. And I don't want you to feel like you've been beat on or cast down or picked on. But I'm not going to let you leave this church. Amen. Hope, hopefully you, if you're living in sin, hopefully you don't leave this place feeling good about yourself. Amen. Because you shouldn't feel good about yourself. If a homosexual comes in with a moving of the operating of the Holy Spirit. Spirit is be is, 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 people are letting the moving and the operating of the Holy Spirit have His way, and the message of the cross is being exalted. He shouldn't leave feeling good. He should leave feeling convicted. Amen. The reason we ain't got people for convicted is because we got no preachers that are preaching the word hard enough and good enough and true enough to bring old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. I can remember how it was when I was a teenager and things wasn't right in my life with the Lord. And I went to church and I heard the preacher preach. I felt the convicted power of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Get a hold of my heart and let me know that I was not right with God. It ought to be the same today. If a Muslim can come into your church and leave feeling good, there's something wrong with your church. Amen. If homosexuals can come, I'm talking about time after time. Be members. Amen. I know they might come one time. You may not touch on whatever it is. And they may leave out thinking, hey, I may go back there. But they won't come very long here until we mention the fact that homosexuality is an abomination to God. They won't come very long here until we mention the fact that abortion is not a woman's choice. It is murder. Amen. Cold-blooded murder. Hallelujah. But these watchmen that had fallen asleep were not warning the people of these things. Hallelujah. It says they're greedy, dumb dogs. They've fallen asleep. They love their slumber. And not only do they love it, they want you to sleep with them. Amen. They want you to be drunk on the cares of this life with them. That's why they run you off whenever you approach one of them and confront them about some untruth that they are preaching. They don't want you there to stir things up. They don't want you there to ruffle anybody's feathers. So they'll tell you, why don't you just go on down the road somewhere and find you another church where you fit in better. Amen? And listen to me. If they tell you that, if you've approached them because they are not preaching the truth of the Word of God, and if they tell you that, or if they're not willing to say, hey, you know what? You're right. That is what the Scripture says. You shouldn't have to wait for them to tell you to go on down the road and find you another church. You should shake the dust off of your feet and leave. I know people that sit in churches that were not preaching the truth for years claiming they were waiting until God led them somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Compare what they're preaching to the book and if it don't line up with that, leave. Mm-hmm. Don't wait to feel the Spirit moving you out of that church. Amen? I've heard people say, well, God had me in this false doctrine for a reason. God didn't have you in that false doctrine for a reason. God didn't have you in that church that was not preaching the truth for a reason. He gave you His book and His truth for you to compare what was going on to it. And if it doesn't line up with it, He told you to shake the dust off your feet, say goodbye and get out of there. Amen? Because sooner or later, if you fellowship with them devils, they'll rub off on you. You'll begin to say, well, maybe there is something to what they're saying. Maybe I am a little God. Maybe I can speak things into existence. Maybe I do have the power of creativity in my mouth. You better get away from that people. The Bible says from such 
turn away. So we see this morning here in Isaiah the 56th chapter, which is probably about as far as we're going to get. But we'll pick up next week, Lord willing. And he says, these watchmen, instead of watching and warning of the dangers, instead of watching and warning of the approaching enemy, instead of watching and warning of the devices of the devil, they're drunk. They're asleep. They love their slumber. They cannot bark. They don't want to offend somebody. I don't want to offend anybody either. But I'm more concerned about your soul than I am your money. I'm more concerned about your soul than I am being popular. And the, most of the preachers in our pulpits across the country, I know not all. I'm not, I don't have an Elijah spirit on me this morning. I'm not up in the cave saying, Lord, I'm the only one that's living right. The Lord said, I've got 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. I know there are men and women of God across this nation and around the world that are still preaching the truth of God's word. I know that. But if you put it as far as percentages, the largest percentage of them are not preaching the truth of God's word. And someone needs to serve them an indictment today and tell them either, either sound the warning or get off the wall. Either sound the warning or get off the wall. We have people pleasers, even so much so that they will, whenever they go into a big city to build a church, to open one up, they will go around to the sur surrounding neighborhood and through the town and they'll knock on doors, not to share the gospel, Sister Patty, but to ask those people, tell them, we're opening up a new church. What would you like? What would you like for us to have at that church? What would it take to get you to come? And what they end up with, they end up with entertainment halls, concert venues, with no altar, no crosses, and no truth. Amen with music that you can't tell the difference, that you can't tell the difference between the world and what's godly. Music so loud you can't hear the lyrics. I saw some videos not long ago, and I won't name the church, but it astounded me how far they had strayed. It didn't even sound like contemporary, and I'm not a big contemporary a uh, uh, gospel contemporary music fan, but I like some of it, and and I don't I don't I don't bash someone for listening to, listening to that. It's just not something that I've ever cared much for. There are some that I like. There are some that I listen to some contemporary praise. This didn't sound like that. This had the this had the loud ringing of the electric guitar. And the bashing of the drums and the mind pounding sound that was so loud you could barely hear what the singers were saying and what they were saying, they were screaming. Whoa. And I told somebody, I said, there ain't no way. I couldn't sit through that. There ain't no way that I could sit through that. And sadly, that's what you see in most churches. Not all of them, but some of them do just have the contemporary. And that's what I thought this church had until I started watching some of the videos. And it saddened me. It saddened me to see what I saw. And to hear those behind the pulpit preaching from other versions. And I thought when I saw these things, I thought the pastor would have never allowed that. Of course, he's done gone home be with the Lord. The world says that they'd roll over in their grave. Of course, we know that's a worldly saying. They're not even in the grave, just that old shell. But it certainly would be a troubling thing if he walked in and saw what I saw in that video. And that happens, why? Because they want a bigger crowd, because they want a younger crowd, because they want people to attend and to build up their numbers, even if they have the best of intentions. 
Being like the world to try and win the world has never been God's way. It has never been God's way. I had a boy, and I'm closing. We'll pick this up next week. God probably think, oh, yeah, good. Uh, he stood out here on the sidewalk and told me about a, a heavy metal rock singer that had gotten saved. But he still sings heavy metal rock. He just changed the lyrics to say something about Jesus. There is a spirit behind that. Mm -hmm. There is a spirit behind that. And just out of curiosity, I tried to watch one of his songs. And it's a good thing they had the lyrics coming up on the screen for you to read them because you certainly couldn't understand half of what he was saying. There's a spirit behind that. My Bible still says come out from among the world and be a separated people. That's not Old Testament. That's under grace. Touch not the unclean thing, unclean thing and I will receive you. You will be my people. I will be your God. But the church of today has allowed all these things. In order, why? In order to reach a crowd. In order to bring a crowd in. We have churches. We have churches that have to have three services. Have to have an early morning service and then a Sunday morning service. And then a Sunday afternoon service because they have so many people. They can't fit them into the building. They can't feel, fit them into the building <clears throat> where they're at. We saw during Super Bowl week. A clip from a church where the pastor was dressed in a referee's outfit, riding on a chain like thing, swinging back and forth across the stage for the halftime show. Oh, I saw last night where this video clip of this church who, at their halftime show, they were playing some kind of a game and they were using the Bible as the football. And someone hiked it to someone and they put it down and somebody ran and kicked it out into the crowd. God have mercy. Amen. What kind of mess? I thought it was bad enough whenever the pastor would say, hey, everybody wear your favorite football team jersey next week. We're going to have beans and weenies and hot dogs and, 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 and popcorn and we're going to watch the game. I thought that was bad enough. But to see him kicking the word of God, I don't know if it was the word of God or not, it might have been some other version. Probably was. In this church, I doubt very seriously it was a King James. It was probably one of those others. Whatever it was, I'm sure it contained something of the Word of God in it. Yet they treated it as if it was a football and kicked it out into the crowd. And there's 35,000 people go to that church. And you should have heard the roar of the crowd whenever they kicked the Bible out into the audience. And I thought, God have mercy. How far has the church of God fallen, Brother Jim? When you go in and it's dark, many of them don't even turn their lights on until it's time to preach. And sometimes they don't turn them on then. They just have a light on the platform. It's dark. They hang up dark curtains. They put, they put up th dark things on the walls. The only thing that's lit up is the, it's like a concert venue where those that are on the stage are beeping and bopping and dancing around. They've got their praise worship. They've got their praise groups uh, that do their fancy things and they've got their dancers that do these fancy things and the spotlight is on them and the people are in the audience and they're screaming and they're hollering. They're feeling something. Yeah, they felt something at the kids' concerts. They felt something at the Def Leppard concerts. Their emotions will cause you to think you are feeling the spirit of of God when you ain't it's only emotion amen if it is something ungodly it is not the spirit of God you are feeling it might be a spirit you're feeling but it is not the spirit of God and we are seeing this over and over in our churches today and next Sunday Lord willing we'll talk about some of the warnings that are not being heralded from the wall by the watchmen of today some of the things that they are not they are mute on that they do not mention because they have got drunk on the pleasures and the cares of this life. And instead of being separate, instead of being the church, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a saying that people used to say you're so heavenly minded that you're, that you're no earthly good. I don't see much of that. What I do see is people that are so earthly and worldly minded that they are of no heavenly good. Amen. Hallelujah. And much of this can be laid at the feet of pastors and preachers who allow it to go on. 
You all know very well what took place here. I don't know how long ago it's been now, but it's something none of us will ever forget. I could have sat in the pew and allowed whatever that was that came out of that box to continue, but that, that sent, that sent a, 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 I don't, it's not chill bumps, but it, it, it caused me to, I felt the powers of darkness. Mm-hmm. That's the only way I know to put it. I felt the powers of darkness on that. And I repented, and I asked your forgiveness for it. I still to this day cannot believe that I allowed it to go as long as I did. But every time I thought I would shut him up, he would go in another direction. I would think, well, maybe now he's going to straighten it out because it didn't, wasn't even nothing like what I was told it was going to be. Maybe now he'll go in the right direction, but then he would go off, and I think I got to stop this. Then he would go, he'd start saying something good. But when he brought out the music, I'm telling you, that's the kind of music that they're playing in a lot of churches today. That's how they think they get their victory, and there is nothing behind that short of a demon, demonic power. Amen. Hallelujah. A demonic power that I felt as soon as he turned it on. And a lot of churches today would have clapped their hands and hooray'd that, and cheered that. And thought that was the best thing. This is wonderful. But it wasn't wonderful. It was something from the devil. Not something from the Lord. And sadly we see that is the main drawing point for many churches today. I talked to a man this past week. He said he goes to a cowboy church. Hmm. Pastor wears a cowboy hat and shorts. To preach. Now listen to me. I've never said you have to wear no tie, no three-piece suit. But I can tell you this, you ain't preaching in my church in no shorts. Amen. Amen. And if you're wearing your cowboy hat, I'm going to ask you to take it off when you get up to preach. Not because it, it has to do with respecting the house of God and the presence of God. Amen. You ain't at a rodeo. But they do these things because they don't want to change. They, won't, they don't want to come out of their world for the gym. They want to bring Jesus into it. So they have motorcycle churches. They have cowboy churches. Rock churches. And all of these things. Because instead of coming out from among the world, and this responsibility is for the pastors to say, hey, this ain't right. You've got to lay that stuff aside and come out and be different than you were before. If you're out there this morning under the sound of my voice and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you haven't already turned me off, if you die without Jesus, you will go to hell. If you die lost, you will not go to heaven. And you say, preacher, how do I, how do I get saved? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. If you'll call out on His name and say, Lord Jesus, save me. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. If you'll do that, He will save you. Now I know this morning that the message that I preached wasn't so much for in here as it will be for those that will watch later. And I know the big name preachers aren't going to watch it, but maybe somebody that's following them will. There's sometimes the Lord will give me a message and I'll think, Lord, I mean, I know who our crowd is. I don't know that this applies to them. The Lord says, preach it. That's what I do. You preach it. And somebody else will hear it by radio or somebody will watch it on video. Be careful who you listen to and who you follow. Because if they're not going the right way, you'll end up in the ditch. What's the Bible say? The blind lead the blind and they both follow into the ditch. Amen. Somebody else this morning have something before we go.